Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the midweek message from Messiah Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia. My name is Pastor Ryan Radke, and we are getting into the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in a series I'm calling New Normals Are Messy. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of uh, the people of Israel coming back from exile to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, to rebuild the temple, to kind of reestablish what it meant to be God's people. And um, it's it's got its bumps along the way, as we see, as we read. And um, some are of, are of their own making, and some are of you know, the situations that they find themselves in. Um, but, uh, you know, we're returning to sanctuaries and church activities after a long time, a whole year and a half apart from one another. And uh, even if we're getting back or other congregations have been back, it still maybe isn't exactly the same as it was. Um, our routines, our practices have been disrupted. Um, so you know that you just don't go back to normal overnight. And so these, these books talk about this kind of unique history of Israel's return um, and to Jerusalem and to the following uh, surrounding towns um, after 70 years and Babylon. So not a year and a half pandemic, 70 years of exile, um, but still there's uh, uh, hopefully some parallels and some things we can learn from this. I think there is. Um, but yeah, the return, the rebuilding process, they were messy to say the least. And so we'll see with the, with the living word that is the Bible, that though it was written thousands of years ago, uh, it still speaks to us today. So we'll see what the living word has to teach us about their experiences returning from exile and what it has to teach us returning from pandemic, but also trying to rebuild the church in general uh, in a world that has changed a lot in recent years and decades. Um, so we're gonna look at the first six chapters of Ezra today. Um, these first six chapters are um, recounting the events of how the Persian leaders, fresh off their conquering of Babylon, uh, give the Hebrews permission and funding to return to Judah and reestablish not just the city of Jerusalem, but also the rebuilding of the temple and the full return of religious practices. And then uh, we'll also hear about some of the early challenges the returning remnant face on a variety of fronts. So there's the Northern Samaritan neighbors. There are the Jews who are still in the area that hadn't been exiled, that had kind of stayed behind and done their own thing for a while without the, the leaders being there. Um, there is, um, you know, they, they remained in the land. So and as you read it, they'll be called like the people of the land or things like that. Um, and some of them intermarried with non-Jewish people, which was a problem for the folks in exile who had tried to really hang on to that sense of identity and culture while they were gone. They come back and they're like, what, you intermarried? Might not seem like a big deal to us, a very big deal to them. Um, you know, so they intermarried with all these non-Jewish ites, the Canaanites, the Ammonites, things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's the Persians, who, even though they're graciously giving the, the, the Jews, the Hebrews, permission to return and do all these things, they're still the overlords. Now, it's not the Babylonians anymore, it's the Persians, but they're still being ruled by somebody else. So there's that, too. So all these things are going on, and we get a little taste of a lot of these dynamics in the first few chapters. Um, for some context, uh, just some historical, geographical, geopolitical background. Um, sorry, itchy nose. Um, remember that Israel, which was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern. Israel had been conquered by Assyria a couple hundred years before the Babylonian exile. So Assyria conquered Israel, and uh, a lot of their people were sent into exile there. Um, the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom, was Samaria. Um, they never really completely recovered from that, and the Samaritans became kind of perennial rivals, maybe even frenemies, uh, of the Jewish people. Um, Babylon was the next major power that came in. They conquered Assyria, and then they conquered Judah, the southern kingdom, and uh, they destroyed the temple. They sent off a few waves of exiles out into Babylon, so these were the leaders these were um, the elites of Jerusalem, of the Jewish people, um, and they were in exile for around 70 years. Um, by then, Persia conquered Babylon. So just another wave came through. So Persia conquered Babylon. Persia's philosophy was not to impose one religion or religious laws on its conquered lands and people. 
um, like Babylon try to and others. And you can read those stories in places like Daniel, um, that, that persecution, that pressure. Uh, Persia was like, no, no, you do your thing. Um, Persia wanted to support the local priests, the local religions, and they wanted to, to cultivate uh, their practice, um, but also they expected um, loyalty in exchange. So we'll let you do whatever you want, but as long as you're loyal to us. So yeah, you, you do what we want you to do, and you can practice your religion however you want to. They felt like it kept everybody happy, but still kept them in control. Um, so they said, you know, we're, we're going to support you guys as long as you're loyal. Uh, so throughout all these wars, all these conquerings, Judah and Israel are kind of geographically at a crossroads of the conflict. If you look at a map of the Middle East, there's that eastern Mediterranean shore with, uh, you know, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, that area. Well, look, if you go on the map this direction, there's Babylon, uh, Persia, which is modern day Iraq, Iran, to the north around this side, you got um, Greece, Rome. If you come around this side into Africa, you have the Egyptian uh, monarchy and empire. And in that same neck of the woods, you have Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, other large African empires of the day. So Israel's kind of right in the middle. If you want to go through any of these places to conquer the other big names and prove you're the top dog, then Israel and Palestine are at a crossroads of conflict. And they had good land, access to the sea. It was a desirable place to conquer and control. Um, so that there's your, your background. Um, okay, let's start into these first six chapters. I'm not gonna read everything, some selected passages, but I hope that you do look over the whole section of chapters one through six of Ezra. Uh, we're gonna start with, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. So here we go. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom and also in a written edict declared. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, excuse me, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings for the house of God and Jerusalem. The heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin, it's, uh, two of the 12 tribes of Israel, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild, in the, rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors aided them with silver vessels, with gold, uh, with goods, with animals, and with valuable gifts, besides all that was freely offered. King Cyrus himself brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar, it's a Babylonian guy, um, had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. King Cyrus of Persia had them released into the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshpazar, the prince of Judah. Um, one little note, uh, when it talks about priests and Levites, uh, in case you don't remember or this is new to you, um, the priests were the ones who carried out the religious duties in the temple. Um, There's a the high priest. They had all different specif specific duties and sacrifices that they did. Um, while the Levites were once one of the 12 sons of, of um, Joseph, excuse me, of Jacob, and uh, they didn't get a portion of the land. Instead, the Levites were set aside as a special uh, priestly tribe. And uh, they were spread throughout the other 12 tribes with cities and, and uh, communities within the other areas. And they helped handle the local religious customs and tend to the day-to-day -day matters. So you had the Levites spread throughout for the day-to-day. -day, and then the central hub at the temple was handled by the priests. So in this chapter and uh, throughout, you will hear about specific lists of and mentions of uh, Levites and priests. That's the difference. Those are the two functions that they had. Um, 
because it was important uh, for the reestablishment of Jewish life and worship that the full complement of priests and Levites and other temple workers, you'll hear about singers in later chapters, things like that, um, and the holy temple objects, those things that the Babylonians had taken with them, all the, the sacred objects from the temple, um, all of those are part of the return plans. Uh, a couple of questions to think about. Um, as we're coming back from a year and a half away and apart, what is essential for us to bring back to church as we return from pandemic protocols? And I, we've had, I've had some conversations with people. I know different things that are important uh, for many people or for individuals, um, but frame it this way. What do we need to fully worship God? Were we fully worshiping God this whole time? If not, what were we missing? And as we come back together, what do we really need to fully worship God? Um, so think about that. Uh, another thing, um, thinking about this whole geopolitical thing and how Persia handled things. Persia will let you do what you want as long as you, you know, don't rock the boat. Um, there's conversations and debates about church and state. Um, that's not new in our country. Um, but we don't live in a Persia is our overlord situation. We don't have that sort of monarchy dictating things to us. Um, so as you heard or read about the political background of Ezra, some of the history of the region, um, any thoughts or comparisons with regard to political religious dynamics in our country today? Remember, keep it civil as you're having these conversations, but also make sure that, that you're not putting what we're going through on the same level as Persia. Because as you read these stories, as you hear the... Um, um the threats that they were under genuinely it's not it's not the same maybe there's some points of contact uh, but really what 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 does this have to say to us in terms of comparison in terms of our um, geopolitical situation when it comes to church and state i don't know if i just opened a can of worms there but discuss amongst yourselves i'm virtual uh but you can talk to me later that'd be fine that'd be good uh Chapter two of Ezra, uh, we're not going to read right now. It's an extensive census of the returnees. It is a lot of names. Um, but take some time to consider the names. Read them, whether you can pronounce them or not. Take some time to actually read it, because that is also a way to honor our ancestors in the faith, to, to tell this story. All of them were a part of it. And while you're doing that and thinking about that, uh, consider this. The returning exiles were the descendants of refugees. They were returning home after a long time away. Um, they had been political prisoners. So as you read through Ezra and Nehemiah, ponder that, consider that, and consider more recent examples of refugees returning home. For instance, uh, people in Rwanda following their civil war had lived their whole lives in refugee camps in places like Tanzania to the south. Um, what, what parallels do we have here? What does this teach us in terms of what maybe they're living through and how God has responded. Um, think about other refugee situations, political prisoner situations, um, genocide, war situations that are going on right now. Um, there's, I believe it's pronounced the Uyghurs in China. There's the Rohingya people in the Burma area that are getting pushed out. Uh, think of the ongoing conflict in Syria and Yemen. Think of everything that's going on in Central America that's making people want to trek thousands of miles uh, to find something better here. Um, the Bible is not a stranger to refugees and immigrants. And typically, the way they're treated is with compassion and mercy. There's not even laws to protect them. Um, but then put that up alongside how the ites are handled, the Canaanites and everybody else. Well, this is the promised land. And I know that you've been living here for generations. But I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, forbid our people from marrying yours and also um, go to war with you and kill a lot of you. How does that all work together? Laws to protect immigrants, but uh, Old Testament mandates to knock out the people of the land. It's complicated. So have all that swirling around in your head as you read and as you read our world right now. Um, as we will see in Ezra and Nehemiah, both the exile and the return involve religious, ethnic, national identities. Who are, who are we as God's people? Who are we? Um, what does this all mean? 
so you know our return to worshiping in the building isn't on the same level as as these examples but we can still ponder how did our absence from the building and the changes to our church life and our participation um, how did that affect your identity did it affect your identity and if so how uh, as always if you want to come talk to me about any of these questions or send me an email or or drop a line in some way i welcome the conversation uh, next up, we're going to move to Ezra chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Um, yeah. When the seventh month came and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundation because they were in dread of the neighboring peoples, and they offered burnt offerings upon it to the Lord morning and evening. And they kept the festival of booths as prescribed and offered the daily burnt offering by number according to the ordinance as required for each day. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and all the sacred festivals of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from King Cyrus of Persia. So I just want to point out in this section that... Um, Ezra and the other leaders made sure that worship practices started even before the building was ready. Um, just like we kept doing our best to worship online or in the parking lot, even before we were technically allowed back in the building, or at least in a way that made sense. Uh, so thinking of that, what are your priorities? What were your priorities as we approach normal or whatever that is? Um, those are air quotes, not a bunny. Uh, what rituals are the most important as we return? Um, what are your fears about coming back? Uh, the Israelites were afraid of the neighbors who wouldn't want them coming back and resettling. Uh, most of them didn't complain when they got exiled and taken away. Israel was a strong nation. So what what is our fears? Um, what's what What is it that we're considering as we get back to normal? Uh, what rituals, what fears, priorities. And then also uh, one commentator remarked, continuity of tradition is deemed important for the legitimacy of worship. So a variation on the question I asked earlier, what makes our worship legitimate? Is it the traditions? Is it something else? Skipping ahead just a little bit to Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. So in the rare instance that you lived long enough to be older than 75, 80, and actually remember the original temple, which life expectancy was not that long back then. You're seeing this new temple foundation laid and seeing what's left of the first one still, the destruction. <clears throat> Mixed feelings, shouts of joy that it's being built, but weeping and sorrow that it was destroyed. They've missed so much. So I wonder, where is our joy as we come back together? 
where is our sorrow? Where is your joy? Where is your sorrow as we gather? And then we've been talking a lot about pandemic and coming back from that, pan out from our focus on the pandemic for a moment. The world has changed so much over the last few decades. And church has not always or often kept the pace. And we can see the difference as we look at the pews on a given Sunday, not just at Messiah, but in a lot of churches, not just Lutherans. Um, who is here? Who isn't? Answer that question using whatever categories you can think of. Um, age, education, wealth, gender, race. Um, Who's here? Who isn't? As we return to the building, what is it that we are rebuilding for our temple to God? What do we want to rebuild? What should we be rebuilding? Just go back to how it was? Or do we look out at the pews and look at the world that has changed around us and say, what are we doing now? And how do we make sure that whatever sorrows we have, that joy is part of our foundation? Moving along. I want you to remember all the context, the background I gave on Assyria and Samaria above. Uh, and then we're going to read Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of families and said to them, let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of King Esar Hadan of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families in Israel said to them, you shall have no part with us in building a house to our God. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, the kings as, as King Cyrus of Persia has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. And they bribed officials to frustrate their plan throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia and until the reign of King Darius of Persia. Okay. It's interesting that both groups name drop, one name drops King Cyrus of Persia, the other name drops the old king of Assyria a couple hundred years before. Um, Ezra turns down this offer from the people of the land to help rebuild. And on first thought, you might think, well, why? They said they've been worshiping the same God. I think they have. Um, you know, they want to help rebuild. Why not get this done? Um, well, the next passages of the letter um, show how these rivals then send a note to the king of Persia saying, you don't want these guys to rebuild. They're dangerous. They'll overthrow you. They're strong and nobody likes them. And then Persia replying, wait a minute. Yeah, we did see in our records that they are rebellious people. Maybe we shouldn't let them rebuild. And, and so the rebuilding efforts halt right now. Um, so they, they reject this offer. There's a lot about purity and no, it's got to be God's people. We got to do this right this time. We didn't do it right the last time. And they married these other ites and foreigners and we don't want them to be any part of this. And they their, their ancestors didn't help us when we were being attacked and they laughed when we were brought to exile. So we don't want any of their help. And they're probably worshiping other gods too. And that's what got us into trouble, all of this stuff. So that's this situation. Coming back to our situation, rebuilding, returning. So as we return and rebuild, both post-pandemic and then in this climate of dwindling church membership and kind of post-institution, who is at the planning table for our rebuilding? Is it only the people who come back to the building? You know, what about the people who liked the parking lot? What about the people who preferred virtual worship? What if people wanted to keep worshiping in their PJs in the building? What if people don't want to come back? What about the people who weren't coming in the first place? Should we talk to them while we rebuild? Maybe that make them want to come. I don't know. Um, what does it mean for an incarnational life? Jesus was the word made flesh. We're the body of Christ in the world. 
What does that mean if people just want to stay virtual? Can we handle that? Can we adapt? Is it okay? Um, what about the folks who stopped coming long before the pandemic? And what would they dream about and long for in a rebuild and a reopen of the church that would make them want to come through the doors? When I read this, I wonder, well, what is at stake for the adversaries, for the people of the land here? You know, was it just land and property and power and, and political stuff and wealth? Or was there more to it? Um, can any of us relate to them today that they didn't want Israel to just come back or Judah to just come back and put it back the way it was? Can we relate to that? Are there some things that you don't want to go back to the way it was? Um, the rest of this chapter, like I said, has the, the letters back and forth. Chapters five and six um, continue the story. Um, oh, I skipped a question. Sorry. Who are the stewards of record keeping since Persia keeps going back to check its records? Who are the stewards of record keeping and history keeping in our congregations? So who is it? And, you know, even cameras have changed. It's all digital now. So who is in charge of keeping the stories told? and the pictures and the histories recorded so we can learn from them and remember them. Okay, chapters five and six uh, continue the story. Um, after a while, the rebuilding resumes. Um, Ezra and others are just like, you know what? We're just gonna keep building, whatever. So they do. Um, they're like, we need to finish this. God wants us to do this, so they do it. So the Samaritans and other people of the land then basically say, oh, well, hey, you can't do that. Can you, can you do that? No, you can't do that. Uh, Persians, you know? We're going to tell. So they send another letter to the Persians, another note. And um, they say, uh, you know, can they do this? And Persia replies, oh, you know what? We checked our records. Turns out they can. We forgot. King Cyrus made this whole decree. It's all been a big misunderstanding. Yes, they can keep building. Oh, and by the way, you, you seem really worried about this. So um, you guys get to help them now. Uh, kick in some money. That's an order or else. The or else is pretty graphic. Uh, it's chapter 6, verse 11. Um, Furthermore, I decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of the house of the perpetrator, who then shall be impaled on it. The house shall be made a dunghill. Like I said, Persia might seem all great and all compared to Babylon. You can do what you want. You can worship. Go ahead, rebuild your temple. They'll still impale you if you step out of line. Just saying. Um, so let's read chapter five, verses 13 to 15. Um, uh, find my spot. Here we go. Uh, however, King Cyrus of Babylon in the first year of his reign made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. Moreover, the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem and had brought into the temple of Babylon, these King Cyrus took out of the temple of Babylon and they were delivered to a man named Sheshbazar whom he had made governor. He said to him, take these vessels, go and put them in the temple in Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt on its site. So they checked the records. Turns out King Cyrus said, yes, you're good. Greenlit all of this. Um, and they prospered. Um, yeah, they need to prosper. They need to be fruitful and multiply. Um, yeah. And then looking that this is the prosper part. I think actually that was a typo. Sorry, folks. That should be chapter six, verses 13 to 15. Ignore your handouts that you have. I just read the wrong passage. Still good. It's all good. Let's jump to 6, 13 to 15. My apologies. Uh, then according to the word sent by King Darius, Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bozani and their associates did with all diligence what King Darius had ordered. So the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo, they finished their building uh, by command of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus, Darius, and King Artaxerxes of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. That's a little better. So they prospered. That was the word I was really trying to hook onto. They finished what they were supposed to do, that God told them to do, that Cyrus and now Darius both decreed they could do. And um, they prospered. Finally, to the question, in what ways are our worship um, 
sorry, as we rebuild on all levels, what will help us prosper? So in this situation, it was worshiping before the building was done. It was putting God first. It was standing up to both the uh, uh, people of the land, but also to Persia when they just started rebuilding again anyway. What will help us prosper in our efforts? And who are our present day Haggai and Zechariah? Who's our guiding prophets right now in general? Now, back to chapter six. Uh, we're going to do verse 17 and then 19 to 20. So a little jump in there. Verse 17, they offered at the dedication of this house, the temple, uh, this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Then uh, skipping to 19 and 20, is that what I said? Yes. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For both the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, all of them were clean, so they killed the Passover lamb for all of the returned exiles, for their fellow priests, and for themselves. Uh, so if you remember, it was only Judah and Benjamin or, and the Levites, so two out of the 12 official tribes plus the Levites and priests uh, had been back. But as they're making these first sacrifices, they're sacrificing for, for all 12 tribes of Israel. They're doing the Passover lambs for for everybody for all of the exiles so i wonder as we are getting back together uh, in what ways are our worship practices on behalf of the others who aren't here and we pray but in what ways is what we do not just for ourselves who are here to worship god to be together but how is our presence in worship for the people who aren't um if it isn't should it be how could it be how would we let them know do they need to know how is our time of worship together here for the people who aren't here? Um, one other question on that passage. What They were building towards Passover and these big festivals and, and worship services. What is the big thing that we're building towards now that we're back? What is the big thing we're going to dedicate to God and do for other people now that we're back? Uh, closing questions. This series has been called New Normals Are Messy. So. Um, in light of what we read today, what's messy about the church right now? What's normal about the church right now? What's new about the church right now? And I hope those three questions can guide your ponderings and responses to everything else, um, but also how we want to proceed into the future now as we rebuild and as we regather. Uh, those are my questions for you. Those are some passages. I hope you ponder. Um, think about these things. Uh, send me your thoughts. I'd love to hear them or catch me Sunday. We'll talk. And in the meantime, until next week, uh, please read Ezra chapters 7 through 10 and uh, continue your prayers and your care for one another. And for those not here, uh, new normals are messy, but God is with us as we rebuild. And uh, if nothing else, I hope you take that away with you today. See you next time. Be well. Be in peace.